Welcome everyone to the International Day of Education. Um, it is from knowledge to action, fostering sustainability competencies for a better tomorrow. And I would like to welcome all speakers and the audience for this uh, yeah, very interesting and uh, mind opening one hour webinar. My name is Nicole Sanger. I'm the Vice President for Research and Sustainable Development at Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences in Germany. And um, saying that, the University of Applied Sciences at Darmstadt is partner within the European University Technology um, Alliance uh, together with TU Dublin. And uh, this is how I come to this uh, yeah, wonderful idea that I will chair this session. I would like to introduce um, the speakers of today. So the first one will be uh, Jennifer Boyer. Jennifer was, and was the first vice president for sustainability to be appointed in Ireland. And she's the vice president. She works to embed sustainability across the university and ensure TU Dublin fulfills its aims to become a beacon for living and breathing sustainability. And this is how we work together as well within the UT Plus um, idea. In her previous role as assistant head of school in architecture, she enjoyed working with colleagues to implement a student-centered revision of the architecture curriculum to embed the UN sustainable development goals and address the challenges of climate change. Can I get the next slide, please, Anna? Okay, and the next one, Johan Hans Kurtzer. He's a higher education specialist with over 25 years of experience in higher education and instructional design, social constructivism, assessment practices, and building collaborative partnerships. He currently serves as team leader and senior specialist for the United Nations Institute for Training and Research called UNITAR. Jon Hans' research interests focus on the cross-cultural challenge of framing attuned leadership for positive change in higher education, including developing transformational learning for delivering results within the UN 2030 Agenda Framework. Our next speaker is Fiona Darby. She's current role as a team lead on supporting the university's implementation of the strategic plan for the design and development of the new education model for TU Dublin. Teaching and researching in higher education for over 20 years, Janola's interests, areas of interest include diversity, equality, inclusion, and belonging, critical reasoning, life-wide education, organizational behavior, and HRM. Fionnula's competent completed her Doctorate of Education in 2020 at Maynooth University with the Department of Higher and Adult Education. Her research focuses on inclusion and belonging in higher education for Black and minority ethnic students. And our fourth speaker is John O'Connor. Um, he has worked in the Irish design sector and in higher education for most of his career. He was appointed head of the School of Art and Design in 1998 and subsequently director and dean of the College of Arts and Tourism from 2012 to 2021. John played a lead role in the application for university designation, which resulted in the formation of Ireland's first technological university in 2019, the Technical University, Technological University Dublin. And he is a, has a current role as a strategic lead for the European University of Technology, in which he leads to Dublin's participation in this new kind of University, a partnership of nine universities across the European Union, which Darmstadt is part of one. So these are the speakers. And we also have a student representative, Mohamed Neem. He 
is the United Nations Youth Delegate for Ireland, and he is the Deputy President at Irish Second Level Schools uh, Students Union. He's an 18-year-old activist from Mayo Island. He has completed his leaving certificate in 2023 and is taking a gap year at the moment. He currently serves as the United Nations Youth Delegate for Ireland, the youngest for, to ever be selected globally. He also is the Deputy President of the Irish Second Level Students Union. Morgan began his activi activism journey as a young age when he joined the Green Schools Committee in primary school and he was a part of his local scout group. He has been involved in most of the major youth organizations in Ireland at the highest of levels. I'm very happy to have you all here. And um, I'm not sure if we are going now, starting with the introductory remarks by Frank Borchardt. Yes, Nicole, thank you very much for the, for okay. the presentation. Um, it's nice to see that we have 90 participants already, so my, we might as well just pass through the internet to the um, Frank's uh, introduction uh, to this webinar. Um, this message was pre-recorded and I will play it right now. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed participants and distinguished guests, welcome to this online discussion convened on the auspicious occasion of the UN International Day of Education. Today we gather here to shed light on a crucial aspect of learning that transcends traditional academic boundaries and holds immense significance for building a peaceful world in the 21st century. The vital role of social, emotional, and behavioral domains in education. In an era marked by unprecedented global changes, from social unrest to environmental crisis, it is imperative that we recognize the interconnectedness between education and peace. While academic knowledge equips individuals with valuable skills, it is the cultivation of social emotional intelligence and positive behaviors that truly empowers them to navigate the complexities of our modern world. Education, in a true sense, extends far beyond textbooks and classrooms. It encompasses the holistic development of individuals, nurturing their emotional well-being, fostering empathy, and promoting positive relationships. By investing in the social, emotional, and behavioral domains of learning, we foster values of tolerance, respect, and understanding that are the cornerstones of this. Today's celebration of the UN International Day of Education serves as a reminder of our collective responsibility to create inclusive and empowering learning environments. It is an opportunity to reiterate our commitment to equipping learners with the tools they need to thrive, not only academically, but also emotionally and socially. Through this discussion, we aim to explore the transformative power of social emotional learning and its impact on building bridges, resolving conflicts, and fostering a culture of peace. We will delve into the strategies, best practices, and innovative approaches that can be employed to integrate social, emotional, and behavioral domains in educational frameworks, ensuring that every learner has the opportunity to develop the skills necessary to become compassionate, responsible global citizens. Together, let us embark on this journey of reflection, exchange, and collaboration by embracing the importance of social, emotional, and behavioral domains in education. We can shape a brighter future for generations to come, one that is characterized by harmony, understanding, and a profound commitment to peace. Thank you for joining us on this momentous occasion, and may our deliberations today ignite a passion for transformative education 
that empowers individuals to create a peaceful world. Happy International Day of Education. Thank you. We will now start our um, first intervention with uh, Dr. Jennifer. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking to you today on the International Day of Education. I'm coming to you live from TU Dublin's East Quad on the Grange Gorman campus, which is now Ireland's largest creative arts center. And you can see behind me a range of activities, a range of age of learners, and the overall environment here with transparent walls and open air atriums and inclusive infrastructure that reflects TU Dublin's ambition to become one of the world's most sustainable universities. I'll start the session and give an overview uh, and a perspective from Ireland's first and largest technological university who has put sustainability at the heart of the organization around our strategic pillars of people, planet, and partnership. These pillars guide how we translate our knowledge of what we know we need to do into real action as a university. I'll map out a series of initiatives that show how we're moving from strategy into implementation and curating the ecosystem around us where sustainability values, attitudes, and outcomes can thrive. Under our planet pillar within the CU Dublin strategic intent, we aim to be a living, breathing powerhouse of sustainability, where through our operations, our academic programs, and the research that we focus on, we address the challenges facing the world to impact positively on the planet, knowing that education is the engine behind attaining this. We know that UN SDG 4 quality education is not a goal into itself, but rather the vehicle through which all other SDGs can be achieved. In 2019, TU Dublin Strategic Intent 2030, which aligns to the horizon of the global goals, was published and it set out our objective to create responsible global citizens through the embedding of sustainability competencies across all of our programs in order to deliver a new generation of graduates who will lead and further embed sustainability into their lives and their work with passion and purpose. To action this, one of our three new university-wide graduates is sustainability. And we've defined this as sustainability focused global citizens are defined at TU Dublin as students who have developed the key competencies of embodying sustainability values, embracing complexity in sustainability, envisioning sustainable futures, and acting for sustainability to address the SDGs as set out in the European Sustainability Competency Framework called Green Comp. Currently, we are working to review all of our academic programs over the next 24 months to embed this and other key competencies into the academic curriculum. Sustainability affords an attractive and a feel-good factor to making change, which is not often easily done. And recognizing this, we have a team within the sustainability unit who are facilitating SDG engagement workshops with colleagues across the university, program teams, students, and operations teams to inspire change in our processes and our systems to achieve our objectives. Another interesting dimension is how we would best capture the range of ways in which learning sustainability competencies can take place. For this, we're adapting descriptions of the ASH STARS academic curriculum categories, which take into account not only the module or the program outcomes within the curriculum, but also things like sustainability literacy and assessments such as Sully Test immersive learning experience, and engaging students in campus as a living laboratory to learn at a practical real world level. The work of embedding a new or refreshed set of competencies will take time because our program catalog is large and we are ambitious, but we recognize this in our implementation plans. And in the work that we do, the possibility and positivity is huge for those who wish to engage in the journey with us sooner. Knowing that large scale systems change requires lots of actors and influencers. At TU Dublin, our work is very much accelerated in part thanks to a number of strategic projects, which my colleagues Fanula Darby and John O'Connor will speak to shortly. We see these strategic projects being able to drive internal change and positive momentum, as in the case with the, the new university education model. 
but also to curate and engage a wider external change champions network of partners across the sector, such as the NTutor project here in Ireland, addressing the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, and also across Europe through the EUT Plus partnership. Thankfully, at this time in Ireland, our national policy context provides the winds at our back with ambitious frameworks and mandates across education, climate action, digitization, and it supports a wider education systems and pipeline reformation in order to transform ourselves for a sustainable future. How organizations individually respond to this and prioritize their work requires leadership and champions at all levels in all places within the systems to achieve this objective. In such a rich sustainability-driven context, TU Dublin's approach to impact is multidimensional, and it has to be, to drive the change within the organization as an exemplar, but then model this outwardly through our impact and our strategic partnerships to other education transformationalists. Through the work that we do, we aim to bring about much wider societal and sectoral engagement around the opportunity to build sustainability capacity within all citizens through the gift of education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And we'll go on with the next statement by Jon Hans. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I would kindly ask um, you just to bear with me because I would like to acknowledge um, our appreciation um, for everyone who has um, taken time out of their busy agendas um, and joining us online. Please feel free as we deliver our different um, sessions and it provokes questions. Please feel free to pop your questions into the chat box and um, we would be very happy to engage with you at the end of the more formal part of this um, webinar. So allow me just to, to loop back to what is the main aim of the, um, the theme of International Day of Education. Um, the next slide, please because the UN framed the 24, 2024 edition as education's a tool for lasting peace. Um, with the colleagues from the EUT Plus network, um, the consortium of nine universities, we try to frame it as from knowledge to action, fostering sustainability, for a better tomorrow. But allow me to stop and to focus a, lit, a little bit on the here and the now. Um, next slide, please. Because if we look at um, the economics and the competence of how do we, not as institutions, but how do we honor our moral contract as educational institutions with our students, our learners? Again, let's set the context. Very often when we talk about students, we talk about the traditional student, someone who leaves school, somebody who then goes into um, a college or a university. But we very often do not include um, lifelong learning, continued learning, um, professionals, adults um, who wish to start a family, who um, try to, to move on in their career and now want to step back into education. Um, so we include all of these um, individuals as students and learners in, in our discourse. And then I think it's important, again, to put it in context in terms of what are those all important future work skills that we are talking about? And a lot of you, I'm sure, will agree with me as that they are these extreme disruptive shifts that are taking place. 
which has to do with artificial intelligence, which has uh, to do with the rise of smart machines, superstructured organizations where group work, working across different countries, working across different languages, different cultural settings become all the more important. Within these disruptive skills, how do we navigate in making sure that we have the professional competencies in order to be able to operate successfully so that we can add these successes to what we call our professional portfolio? Next slide, please. There is also the reality, ladies and gentlemen, of four worlds coexisting. When we go to universities, um, there are lots of different schools and different departments that will allow us to specialize in one of these worlds. If we just have a quick look, the yellow world is very much in terms of this um, Cooper um, study that was done. So this is where an individual, um, when we study to become um, teachers and lecturers, um, we learn about the seven different types of learners that you would have in a class. And we all have very personal, very fundamental um, motivations and reasons why we want to study in a certain direction. So the yellow world is all about where we it's about human centeredness um, we want to work with people and we feel our strength is to um, be able to to add value from a human perspective if we look to the red world this is very much where we work with technology and artificial intelligence and it's all about innovation discovering new being um, at the forefront of innovation if we drop down to the blue world this is where um corporate uh, business landscape is 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 what rules the world this is absolutely where we want to go and the fourth world is where we have the green world where we talk a lot about sustainability and unfortunately a lot of this sustainable discord discourse is still very much limited to environmental protection and green elements. But let me, if we can go to the next slide. And, and this is where I would like to really make my case on behalf of the United Nations. And that is, we need to integrate different branches of knowledge. Because ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, and as some of you might have experienced and are living it right now, problems. Universities have departments and as academics, we are very worried about our areas of expertise, um, the discipline specific requirements, and the importance of developing our research portfolios that will result in often inadequate comprehensive learning, the, the, the cross-disciplinary perspectives are not given sufficient attention, and as a result, the neglect of the comprehensive 360 degree learning and development needs of our students. So therefore, I would dare to say the future of higher education, traditional higher education, requires that we review our practices as they are not aligned with the current socioeconomic and environmental needs of our students who do not necessarily originate from the geographical location in which the majority of our faculty and our institutions are embedded in. And this is where the EUT plus consortium of nine universities is really an interesting value proposition for future studies because it, it takes a transdisciplinary um, perspective 
and they see that the transformation is not only about the curriculum, it's also about the learning delivery and the student support in terms of research and the OPAL actionable research. And this transdisciplinary approach also seems to be more than necessary. And here I would like to quote both the OECD and Nicolesco, where he stated, transdisciplinarity concerns, which is at once between the disciplines, across the different disciplines, and beyond all disciplines. Its goal is the understanding of the present world, of which one of the imperatives is to unify knowledge and to bring all these different um, fragments of knowledge into one transdisciplinary body of knowledge and to be understood by considering, therefore, the multiple levels of reality based on the socio-political geographical location of our students so that we as educational institutions and as educators can truly honour our social contract. And allow me to conclude on this day to also pay homage to Willem von Humboldt, who was one of those key drivers um, who said, knowledge is both power that brings liberty. He was a champion who believed to nurture education and development helps to develop confident citizens that will contribute to society independent of class, family or economic status. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan Hans, um, pointing out the very humanistic approach that Humboldt has um, yeah, swept over, uh, especially Europe. Um, so our next speaker is Fionnula Darby. Thanks, Nicole. And hello, everyone. My name is Fanula, and in this online environment, I'm grateful to be invited to contribute to this webinar on UN International Day of Education. Like it or loathe it, the 54th meeting of the World Economic Forum convened last week at Davos, which had the theme of rebuilding trust in our fractured world. Global connections are fraying, and this is for a number of reasons, due to geopolitical tensions, there are concerns over the resilience of supply chains, and the mass migration of people as a contributing factor to the rise of nationalism in some of our countries. So I believe that a step towards addressing these issues is an eco-pedagogical framework for sustainable development that integrates the inner development goals as an approach to higher education. So this is the focus of my contribution that I will share with you over the next three slides, and I welcome your engagement with the content that I hope you'll find interesting. What I have to say also overlaps with our vision at TU Dublin for our graduates through the implementation of the university education model. So where to begin? Well, let's begin with Education 5.0, which extends Education 4.0, which includes AI and gamification. But Education 5.0 adds a more human perspective to learning with curricula integrating topics related to sustainability, ethics, social justice, and responsible technology use that provides for the holistic development of the learner. Really, at the essence of this, it's about developing an inner agility mindset that embraces complexity. So how do we do that? Well, by connecting with the inner development goals on the slide there, uh, we can move forward with regard to this area. Our world is on fire. The flames include those oppressed in society, humanitarian disasters and ecological crises. And it can be very easy to feel overwhelmed and wonder why bother or where do you even start? Uh, I would suggest that we start with the inner development goals and tend to that inner flame first. We're very familiar with the 17 SDGs, but to be honest, progress along this vision has been disappointing for many, even though we're more than halfway through to the SDG 2030 targets since they were adopted at the New York uh, UN Summit in 2015. In fact, we talk far more about what ought need to be done to resolve the problems, rather than talking about the skills, the qualities that we need to make them happen. So this is where the IDGs come in. 
The initiators of the Inner Development Goals project were motivated by a belief that there was a gap in our efforts to create a sustainable global society and that what has largely been missing are the abilities, the qualities or the skills individually and collectively to fulfill the SDG vision. The Inner Development Goals framework presents 23 skills and qualities across five categories captured on the slide. They are around being, which is our relationship to ourself and the psychological skills that we need when we face complexity. Thinking, so developing our cognitive skills by taking different perspectives, relating, caring for others in the world around us, uh, collaborating, having a strong set of social skills as we navigate the world's opportunities and challenges, and acting, of course, the, the follow through or the drive for change. As with all these skills and qualities, we need a deep commitment to develop and enhance them, not just tick a checklist. The students and learners will also need a sensible journey uh, to achieve these skills. So a question for you to consider, uh, how prepared do you believe the learners at your institution or the employees in your organisation are currently in the inner development goals? Possibly something for you to ponder on uh, even beyond this webinar. So on the next slide, to come back to the head, heart, hands model for effective teaching and learning for a moment. This is a combination of our heads, the cognitive learning, our hearts, where the deep empathy and compassion for others lie, and our hands, the learning through interaction, as an approach to higher education that encourages transformation and learning. The power of our heart and hands are often overlooked and neglected in learning outcomes. So an eco-pedagogical framework allows us to envisage that head, heart, hands through holistic education for sustainable development of society and to use vision as a sustainable university. This requires contemporary pedagogies and future curricula that should include pedagogies of care, pedagogies of hope and passion curricula, all of which are too often pushed to the margins. We will need to bolster a radical resilience with the ability to read the world to figure out how to how to transform it. We will need to uh, in, embrace diverse knowledge sources and multiple perspectives so that we can begin to unpack the assumptions um, about what's hidden and who benefits and who loses out, as well as an interdisciplinary opportunity to let something new emerge from unexpected combinations. And so to conclude, this is far more about expanding access to education or adding fashionable content to the curriculum or embracing the most and latest shiny teaching aid like ChatGPT. It is about those things, but it's also about delivering generation after generation of global citizens who can thrive and coexist in a rapidly changing world. Is it not more interesting to learn and collaborate with each other, exchanging ideas, goods and services than to celebrate what happens when nations fight each other for power and status. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we are coming to our last speaker. It's John O'Connor, also from TU Dublin and the strategic lead for EUT+. John, please. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I'm trying to share my slides, but somebody else is sharing. I can't do so while another participant is sharing. Hi, John. You might be able to go now. Nope. Maybe now. Yeah, now I can. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully you can see the screen. Thank you. To start, I want to remind you of the key message from the late 20th century media theorist Marshall McLuhan. He advised diligence and attention, recommending we maintain awareness of what is happening around us rather than becoming distracted by the continuous chatter of our contemporary world. We need to keep focus on the technology that is driving development. He urged us to scrutinize the emergence of new and highly sophisticated technology, warning that while we shape our tools, thereafter our tools shape us. What he foresaw at the beginning of what he referred to as the electric age has now materialized in the digital era, a realm where our tools not only shape us, but define the very essence of our humanity. 
Our digital era is characterized by the relentless march of this technological progress. We find ourselves grappling with the unforeseen consequences of our past creations, the internet, virtual worlds, and VR headset devices, along with the advent of generative artificial intelligence, have become the building blocks of our digital existence. As with any technological revolution, the pace is being set by entrepreneurs and profit-driven corporations, often at the expense of broader societal considerations. Ethical and social responsibilities often take a back seat to the pursuit of innovation and financial gain. We need look no further than Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter to see the impact of one powerful man's desire to satisfy his ego, overriding any and all needs of the community or even the greater good. John Carmack, former chief technology officer at Oculus, has suggested that virtual reality might even become a viable economic alternative to the natural world in the face of dwindling resources. David Chalmers, professor of philosophy and neural science at New York University, appears to endorse this view. He argues that VR is real, writing that virtual worlds are not illusions or fictions. What happens in VR really happens. Furthermore, he adds that life in virtual worlds can be as good in principle as life outside virtual worlds. You can lead a meaning, fully meaningful life in a virtual world. On the other hand, it would seem that a recent wake up call has emerged from the AI community itself, urging us to recognize the existential threat posed by artificial intelligence. Their call to action is clear. Mitigating the risks of AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. Some go further, suggesting a doomsday scenario to be triggered as AI develops consciousness at some indeterminate date in the near future. This imminent singularity when technological advancement surpasses human intelligence and becomes irreversible, is posited by some in the sector and is partly responsible for the AI Safety Summit hosted by the British government last year. The proposal is viewed skeptically by David Bates, founder of the University of Berkeley Center for New Media. He questions the validity of such predictions prompting us to scrutinize whether AI is nurtured on flawed and questionably biased human inputs, merely perpetuates existing knowledge, and offering scant comfort stifles the emergence of the truly new. Noel Fitzpatrick, professor of philosophy and founder of the European Culture and Technology Lab at the European University of Technology, argues that artificial intelligence as a form of artificial stupidity is the lack of abstraction, the lack of the ability to think, overwhelmed by the sheer vastness of the data and the size of the task. He articulates a concern that is at the root of this technology. And that is the assumption and widespread belief that everything can be measured and by extension that everything of importance is measurable, that all problems can be solved through the development of bigger data sets and a more powerful computational modeling. Amidst this debate, one certainty emerges, the omnipresence of AI and VR in our future. This fact demands a paradigm shift, shift in our approach to education. In a world with access to unimaginable quantities of raw data, alongside the continuing exponential growth of digital processing capabilities, it becomes imperative that we equip the citizens of tomorrow with skills that transcend the mere acquisition of data and information. They must become proficient in the generation of knowledge that can be adapted to different circumstances 
and applied to analyzing and solving problems. As digital environments continue to evolve, students need to learn not only how to navigate these realms, but also cultivate distinctly human attributes, discrimination, spontaneity, and creativity. Attributes that distinguish human intelligence from artificial intelligence. In the face of current technological development, society needs individuals who can discern and create amidst the rapid evolution of our tools. My responsibility as an educator is clear, to guide students, not just in mastering technology, but in preserving the awareness of their humanity while engaging with the most powerful and potentially perilous tools we have yet unleashed. Thank you. Well, so thank you very much, John. Thank you to all the speakers. And uh, yeah, the question is now to Mohammed. You've seen now different perspectives on sustainability, on measuring, on interdisciplinarity, on AI, virtual reality. How does it feel for you to be a student and to be, um, yeah, interested in a humanistic way of thinking? And how do you, especially as a younger person, cope with all these different aspects within the education? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit on my role as the United Nations Youth Delegate and kind of some of the work I've done on the Sustainable Development Goals and kind of my views on educating young people on the Sustainable Development Goals. So my role, um, which I'm honoured to say that I'm the youngest delegate to ever be chosen globally, I got the opportunity to attend the Sustainable Development Goals Summit back in September in New York and I got to see truly how much work went into kind of the creation of the sustainable development goals um, when working alongside the Irish mission to the United Nations. Um, Ireland, alongside Kenya, as we know, co-chaired the development and agreement of the SDGs in 2015. And then at this year's General Assembly, Ireland, alongside Qatar, proposed a political declaration which re reaffirmed the world's shared commitment to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030 and being kind of immersed behind the scenes of these negotiations, it truly made me understand how difficult it was to even get the SDGs kind of approved in the first place. And Ireland is a leader on an international level in progressing them, but with, on a national level, a lot of countries, as we're aware, aren't progressing on them fast enough. Um, and education is a key to achieving the SDGs and we've kind of discussed that today. And we've passed the midpoint, um, of 2030 and we still have a long way to go and if we're truly going to achieve these 17 goals we firstly need to know what they are essentially and how we as individuals can work towards them and unfortunately when I was in secondary school I'm on a gap year now I just recently finished secondary school in May um I was not taught about the SDGs and they're so broad that they can be incorporated into curriculums across all levels of education and subjects um but we've seen some progress um they're starting to be incorporated in many schools through different initiatives and the introduction of a new sustainability subject for the leaving certificate but not all second level schools are able to offer this and then at third level institutions we've seen the introduction of sustainability modules and courses um but as i said before we need to incorporate sustainability into all aspects of our education and we've seen some great examples of how TU Dublin are doing this today um, but we need to see faster progress across all levels of education and institutions but as mentioned before by some of the panelists here <laughs> it's important that we leave no one behind and ensure that everyone is being educated about these 17 goals and one way we can start doing this is incorporating them into our everyday lives. Um, like I want everyone to think about how many times we see something relating to the SDGs and education for sustainable development during our normal day-to-day -day business and think about ways that they can be incorporated. Um, I can think of so many different initiatives of ways they can be introduced and non-formal education is just important as formal education, especially for younger, the younger generations and the lack of education about the SDGs 
not only is having a negative impact on the world, but on individuals itself. Um, well, the SDGs framework provides for global sustainability around governmental, social and environmental metrics at the core of these agenda and these goals are is humanity and SDG 10, which aims to reduce inequalities within and among countries, seeks to create equity and shared opportunities, as well as ensure social, economic and political inclusion of all peoples without discrimination. And something I've faced my whole life is racism. And it's been mostly been microaggressions, stereotypical remarks or jokes. And I've always been taught to kind of ignore it and move on. And in the past few months, I've seen a massive rise in the racist encounters that I have been facing. And they're no longer social remarks. And I've received endless online abuse. And at my part-time job, I'm constantly being welcomed into the country I was born in and being told that I don't look Irish enough. Um, but oftentimes I make excuses for these persons to justify their actions and just ignore them, move on. But I've learned to use these experiences as a powerful motor for, motivator for myself and my work. Um, and on in the International Day of Education, I would really like to emphasize how education is such an important tool to tackle this. Um, and this is just some of my personal experiences. Individuals across Ireland, across the world, have so many similar in, in experiences and uh, education is truly a way to tackle this and I would really like to encourage any young person here watching to get involved in any way you can. You can educate people around you about the SDGs, you can utilize your talents and passions and achieving these SDGs is about working together. Um, at the end of the day this is a shared goal and we all need to work together if we truly want to achieve them and as I said before education is a real key to tackle this so thank you. Thank you very much. So education is the key to tackle it. SDGs, um, humanities, interdisciplinary work, virtual reality. What do the uh, speakers in the beginning would like to add here? And um, I see Johan Hans raising his hand. And also the, uh, I mean, maybe you can also take a look at the, um, the questions in the Q&A and refer to these as well. Jonhans, please. Um, I I would just like to recognize Mohammed's um, comments that he just made, um, and and Mohammed described himself as an activist, and and I would kindly like to reframe that. And I think Mohammed has just demonstrated his unique leadership, his mm -hmm. courage, um, because Mohammed. You you mentioned that um, you know you very often reminded that you're not a son of the Irish soil that you're not you you don't fit and what you do clearly with great um, um, knowledge and with great competence is that you you engage with people differently because you acknowledge the individual that may be interested, but it comes across in, in, in a more clumsy way. And then you realize how you have to um, engage differently with people. And I think that is key in terms of how we are going to be more inclusive in making sure that these different elements, as you so very elegantly said, the 17 sustainable de development goals are very broad and we very often the discussion um, hones in on the the very broad statements but very often we lack in delving down into the delivering those specific targets and it's individuals like you who is going to deliver that and it's by making that commitment by straightening up and taking the responsibility and i almost want to say to so many um of us who who um found value in your words to say this is where we we need to see how we first as human beings at community level how can we think differently and act differently? How can we then take that back into the classroom so that we can ensure that we work in that learner self-determined 
development because it's only the individual that will decide what will I take from this professor, from this curriculum, and what will I be able to add? And I come back to this idea of my professional capital that I'm going to be able to apply. And I also just want to loop back to what John was saying earlier on. Ladies and gentlemen, let us try to move on from the police state type conversations that we have about control and control. When we talk about artificial intelligence, I showed you this slide um, about the, the role of big data and computer technologies. And if we are still going to try to have checks and balances, we're going to completely miss the opportunity to embrace artificial intelligence to help students to work with this in an ethical manner to add to their professional capital so that they would be able in these um, complex world in which we live, that they would be able to navigate by using artificial intelligence as an ethical tool, because we all know um, artificial intelligence is still lacking in emotions. And this is where um, computer technology still needs the human input. And if we are going to miss the opportunity to continue to have an insight on that, and this is why I think it is so important that we do have these critical discussions, sometimes uncomfortable discussions, but I think it's important that we take inspirations from individuals such as Mohammed to say, let's have the courage to have these um, critical discussions. People may not like to hear what we have to say, but we also have that leadership responsibility as educate, um, institutions of education to make sure that we, we also can have a positive impact today. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if we wait for the day of tomorrow, some people may not survive in the situations in which they find them today. Just look at our own societies, which may not be in conflict, but we have entire um, elements of society that's excluded from the socioeconomic. So we just need to look in the back, the back end of our um, communities to make sure that we become, um, and, and the essence of, of the sustainable development is to leave no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. And I think John would like to. Just thank you, Nicole. Just to, yeah, a brief comment. Um, I, I've been looking through the online comments, and there's a very uh, perceptive one at the end by Fatima Khalife, who talks about um, the quality of education and the, the the pressure on universities for ranking. And and I'd widen that out to just the overall increasingly commercial pressure on universities coming at a time that we have we're moving into mass education where the the day of the university being an elite is no longer affordable to us as humanity um we you know edu um diversity and inclusion is the answer and, and muhammad referred to the importance of education the only way we as humanity and human beings can extricate ourselves from the problems we've created is through education and the the resource we're ignoring globally is the level of diversity that exists among human beings who don't have access to education or the access to education is being controlled or restricted so what we need to do is use these phenomenal tools that human ingenuity have developed and instead of being afraid of them we need to grab them we need to grasp them and we need to use them to, to, to reach those who are currently being excluded. Now that also requires political and, and all sorts of other change, but we have, and we talk about the global north and the global south, those are the connections we need to make because the, we're running out of physical resources on the earth. 
but we look at the amount of human resources we have. Look at the level of, of ingenuity and creativity that, as John Hans says, artificial intelligence and the best computers and the best technology developed by human beings cannot exceed what human beings are capable of. That, that's a fairly basic law of the universe. So we need to reach out to those that we're not reaching currently and extend education opportunities as far and as wide as we can, both in the normal traditional sense, but also non-traditional lifelong learning and so on. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you very much, John. I think Jennifer would like to add something here. Yes, thank you, Nicole. Um, I, I think John and I both went to the same question quite quickly there. Um, and I think that that question of creativity is central to answering the call for how do we take the human resources, the human capital that we have, and reimagine how we do all of this within the limits of the resources that we have. And I think um, from my own experiences, it, it means that there will be an uncomfortable space where actually those that are meant to be experts in uh, knowledge and, and teaching actually have to relearn or have to engage with the learners as the new breed of experts for what the world requires from them and for them into the future. And it's that co-creativity that has to come into to play in a live sense in that the curriculum is no longer a static thing, but it's an emergent space. So the challenges provide the why we would do something different, but how we do that is uh, multiple means and ways, but that's where partnerships, that's where actually going out into the world, that's where actually you know the, the idea of the walls of the university erode quite quickly. And I think that fundamentally challenges so many of the systems that have been built over time to protect the quality, to protect the quantity, and to measure all of this over time. And all of that actually needs a big rethink, I think, as well. Um, and that's the transformational impact. But I think we have to provide the proofs of concept. Um, in meaningful ways that actually advance some of our own shared challenges in the first instance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And when I when I look at the slides that Fiona David said, told us, I mean, it is the heart that needs to be there very, very immediately to look at all these challenges that we face. Is that right, Fiona? Yes, I was just going to come in and maybe respond to a, th um, a theme coming up in the questions around inclusion. Um, and in particular about the curriculum content and how we can diversify and decolonize that. Um, I think the, a starting point is, first of all, one size fits no one. Um, and we are all diverse. So we tend to have this othering as, you know, toxic othering, someone different to it. But actually, every single one of us brings various dimensions of uh, diversity with us into our organizations. And what, what gets watered is gets greener. So if we start to look at the curriculum and look at the content there, there's a huge bias on uh, knowledge from the global north um, and that somehow knowledge from other parts of the world are lesser. Um, and it's about bringing those uh, knowledges into the curriculum, the curriculum of the future, uh, having them equate with what's already in the curriculum. It's not to dilute or water down because that's the pushback you'll get. Uh, we've no space in the curriculum that knowledge doesn't equate to what's already there of course there's space uh, but it, it needs to be i suppose endorsed or facilitated through our quality frameworks um, and how we get um, content approved because a lot of the time it's the system that can block what we want to change um, and that's not a good enough reason not to do it so i think continue to be to be inclusive disruptors, I think that's what this is. This is all. This is all about, and it takes courage uh, to lean into that uncomfortableness. But um, it has to be done, or nothing will change. Well, this was a very good last sentence. It needs to be done because otherwise, nothing gets changed. I think this is what comes out of all of your comments and and, and talks that we need to change and that, we, that the, sustainable, uh, the sustainable development goals are the ones that help us to change the world. They change, they help to change the curriculum. They, they help to change our way of teaching, of educating people. 
and especially to think about all these different aspects of humanity, of uh, of of the green and the water and whatever. So I was I was really looking at that. What gets water gets greener, as a nice sentence. So so we all need to impact all these systems and um, yeah, bring them upside down to really think about what is crucial, what is important, and how we can change this world to be a better one and to be a more sustainable one in the end. So thank you very much for your contributions. Is there someone who would like to add something in the end? Some last remark, or shall we leave it with that? OK, no further remarks. Thank you very much for all your contributions, your thoughts, and also for the um, the Q&A section for your impact here for this discussion. And uh, so have a nice evening and thanks again. And yeah, think about the sustainable development goals and how to implement them in your life, whatever, where you are and what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.